over there. Come dance for me. You amuse me. All right, now get out of my sight. I don't ever want to see your face again. What's up, guys? Michael Laron here with Author Level Up, helping you write world-class stories better and faster. And I write these stories because I believe that each of you has James Patterson, Debbie Maycomer, and Arthur Haley level of talent. And you just need help unlocking it. So if you're new here, consider subscribing and click that little bell, ding, 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 to get notifications every time I have a new video. And boy, am I excited about this video because we're going to talk about how to write minor characters like major bestsellers. And the reason I'm doing this video to begin with comes from a subscriber of the channel, Debbie. And Debbie wrote me uh, with a problem that she was having with her manuscript. And to sum it up for you, she's got a lot of minor characters in her 70,000 word novel, and it feels like she's collecting people. Those are her words. <laughs> I think that's a great way to put it because it does feel like when you have a lot of characters that you're just collecting people and throwing them on the page. And so Debbie wanted to know, uh, wh what should I do? And there were two issues that uh, her and I were, were trading emails back and forth on. And the first was, how many minor characters in a novel is too many? And then the second issue is, to what extent do I need to develop each minor character in my story? Now, I know that many of you are busy folks. You have busy lives. you got a lot of things going on. So I recognize that this video is going to be a little bit longer and a little bit more nuanced and nuts and boltsy than my prior videos. So if you're in a hurry, you can use the timestamp to jump ahead to the nuts and bolts that you can take away to start using in your next manuscript but you will miss out on some golden nuggets. All right, so before we discuss this, we got two issues we need to deal with, all right? How many minor characters is too many, and to what extent do I need to develop them in the story? We need to first talk about what I, as I was researching this, something that was very clear to me that I wanted to make sure that we were, we were speaking the same language, and that is the order of character magnitude, all right? So when you think about the characters in your story, you, and you think about the, the, the level of development that each of those characters gets and then the level of screen time, so to speak, or page time that each character gets, it's different depending on the class of character, right? So I think we can all agree that your main character is going to get more screen time, they're going to get more development, they're going to get more everything by virtue of the fact that they're a main character. Now, you've also got supporting characters who are going to also get development and they're also going to get screen time and they're also going to get the author's attention and resources and love but it's not going to be at the same level as the main character and then when we talk about minor characters here's where i want to make sure i'm, I'm extra clear with with my answer uh, to this question and that is minor characters are characters that they appear regularly or maybe a couple of times throughout a story and they have a minor impact to the story but they're not supporting characters all right but minor characters do have an impact and they can drive the plot of the story to a certain degree. Now, we also have what, what, what I like to call walk-on characters. These are characters where they're not minor characters. They just, they just kind of come in and they come out and maybe they, maybe they have some, some impact on the plot. Maybe they don't. But they usually exist for one sole purpose. And as Debbie and I were talking, um, what we're going to be focusing on in this video are the walk-on characters. We're not talking about minor characters. Minor characters have different rules. They get more development. We're talking about our walk-on characters. So how do we treat our walk-on characters in our novel? What are some of the things that we should be doing? And most importantly, because you're watching this video, what are some of the things that mega bestsellers are doing with their walk-ons, all right? So to give you an example of how, how this works, okay? so. A classic example, you guys know that I don't typically use TV or movie examples to talk about fiction because I don't think it's, it's, it's not apples to apples, but I think this is the easiest way to explain how this concept works, all right? So if you think about the sitcom Seinfeld, Jerry is the main character. Jerry gets most of the time and attention, but Elaine, George, and Kramer are supporting characters, and they get their time in the spotlight, too. And then we've got our minor characters, which uh, there are many minor characters in the Seinfeld franchise, but uh, the Costanzas uh, are a great example of minor characters. They, they, they appear here and there. They maybe get a spotlight, but, and, and usually they're driving the plot. Usually George's dad's up to something, right? Uh, Jerry's parents, um, they're, they're also minor characters. But when I think about walk-on characters on Seinfeld, I think about, um, for example, Jerry's many random girlfriends or uh, Elaine's many random 
boyfriends or uh, the, the sketchy characters that Kramer finds himself in contact with every once in a while. When you think about the Seinfeld episodes, you don't often remember those characters' faces, but they had something to do with uh, either a laugh or something to do with the plot, okay? So that's what I'm talking about here when I talk about ma character magnitude. All right, so our relevant books this week, uh, I dropped them in the opening of this video, and that is uh, we've got some books by, De or a, a book by Debbie Maycomer, Arthur Haley, and James Patterson, all right? These are all mega bestsellers in their own right. Debbie Maycomer uh, is a romance author. Um, Arthur Haley is a thriller author who uh, may not get much name recognition now, but he was a big deal uh, back in the 70s. Uh, and then we have James Patterson, which is, is an author who needs no introduction. All right, these are just three books. I picked them off my shelf randomly to try to answer this question. So just know that if you read another book, you're going to see authors doing different things with their walk-ons. But I tried to find what are the commonalities between three different mega bestsellers and are there commonalities that we can take away and learn? All right, so Debbie Maycomer has got a book. It's called 16 Lighthouse Road. It's a great little novel. Mr. Alan Harris plays really no major part in the story other than he's an attorney trying to help one of the main characters secure her divorce. So he appears about three to four times in the story. He is uh, no impact to the story. Uh, Maycomer doesn't even give him a physical description. I mean, come on. We talk all the time about how characters need physical descriptions. This guy doesn't get a word. We have no idea what Mr. Alan Harris looks like. All right. What we do see from him is mostly dialogue. And when he's speaking, he's usually speaking uh, attorney speak, you know, your honor or my client says or my client strongly believes and so on and so forth. Right. It's, it's what you'd see on TV when you think of attorneys. And uh, there's a few attorney tropes here and there. And about the only thing we know about him, about how he looks, is that he has a legal pad and that he has a briefcase. All right. So I think and this is just my opinion that Alan Harris has one purpose in the story. You know, I mean, out of the two to three pages of the book that he takes up, maybe a little bit more, his purpose is to represent the heroine to help her get her divorce. That's it, all right? That's one example of how Make Homer does it. Second example, because there's, I believe it, it I believe there's got, you gotta give a lot of examples on this. You're gonna start to see the patterns here. Now we also have uh, Mrs. Lana Sullivan. Now Lana has about three to four appearances in the story. Each one is very, very brief. And when I say very brief, I mean a couple of sentences um, and maybe a couple lines of dialogue. And she has no impact to the story for the most part. Um, no physical description. So again, just like the last character, we have no idea what she looks like. No idea. All right. Um, and, and when we do hear from her, it is mostly through dialogue. And her purpose, honestly, is just to play a matchmaker. It's to help this character uh, find somebody that she's going to fall in love with. So that's Miss, Mrs. Lana Sullivan. We move on to Arthur Haley. And uh, Airport is a great novel. It's a great thriller novel if anyone wants to read uh, um, what it's like in the life of an airport and, and have it dramatized. This is, I just I absolutely love this novel. It's one of my all-time favorites. And we have uh, Miss Patsy Smith, who is a flustered ticket agent who we meet at the very beginning of the story. And we meet her through the eyes of one of the female protagonists of the story. And um, uh, Patsy has one appearance, no physical description. The only thing we know about her is that she's, she's crying when we meet her, and she's crying into a linen cloth. <laughs> That's it. And the reason she's crying is because there's been some chauvinist pig that has just treated her terribly, and she feels awful about it. And so the, the female main character is um, trying to toughen her up and also trying to make sure that uh, she gives her a coaching moment that we can't treat our customers this way because the chauvinist pig is being a chauvinist, and so she throws his ticket at him and, and yells at him, <laughs> which he kind of deserved it. But anyway, mostly dialogue, okay? We don't know anything about her. We just know she's talking. And the purpose, I believe, of Patsy Smith is to contrast the female hero because this is one of the first times that we meet this female hero. And so uh, we want to get an understanding of what she's like. And what's really interesting about Patsy is that after she leaves, you know, because she's, she's crying, she's distraught, so the heroine sends her home for the day. And as, as Patsy's leaving, the heroine starts to reflect in this internal narrative about the wild and wacky ways of men in the airline industry and how sometimes um, they, women don't always get treated and how you have to be tough because this main character is tough. Um, and so that's, it's just a great way to kind of get into her head and understand where she's coming from. Patsy helped us do that. All right. Now, we've also got Roberta Bakersfeld in Airport, and she is the daughter of the main character. So we've got a main hero in the story. Um, and 
the only the only contact we have with Roberta is through two phone conversations. The reader never sees her. We get no physical description of who she is. All we know is that she's just a snotty teenager, all right? And she's a little bit angsty. And I believe that the purpose of Roberta is to show how bad the hero's family situation is, right? Because she's talking. She, you can tell she's rolling her eyes. Uh, she makes some offhand comments to the main character about how he's never home. And, and at the end of, the, end of this novel, not really a spoiler, but... Um, he gets a divorce from his wife, and so uh, the character wonders of how, how Roberta's going to grow up with a divorced household and so on and so forth. But she only makes two, like two or three appearances in the story, and they're all phone conversations. Now, that's awfully interesting, isn't it? Now, let's get to James Patterson, because James Patterson is a bit of a black sheep on this. Uh, I chose Along Came a Spider, which is Alex Cross number one. Um, if you've read anything by Alex... In any of the Alex Cross series, you've probably read this one, which is why I picked it. And we've got at the very beginning of the story, in about the third or fourth chapter, an unnamed sergeant who is a colleague of Alex Cross. And as they appear on a murder scene to investigate who killed uh, the character that was killed, uh, we've got this sergeant who kind of waddles up to the characters and he, he's trying to bust their chops. And we only see this person one time. In fact, he's not even named. And we get two to three lines of physical description. I think the guy's compared to a jelly roll <laughs> and an ancient dinosaur, you know, sort of thing. So we get a, get a good sense of how Alex Cross feels about this guy. And again, it's mostly dialogue. And there's a lot of curse words, too. And the purpose of this character, I believe, was to bust the hero's chops and show the culture of the D.C. police department. Okay? Now, last character. I'm going to stop bombing you guys with characters. Last character is uh, Miss Mary Warner, who is a prosecuting attorney. She, she comes along near the 75% mark, I think, of the book, and her goal is to prosecute the main villain of the story. I won't, I won't say anything more than that. She makes about three to four appearances over a period of about three to four chapters. Um, she has no impact to the story other than she succeeds in getting the villain prosecuted, but we all knew that was going to happen anyway. And we get one line of description, and we all we know about Mary Warner is that she has a diminutive frame. That's it. Right. And again, we see mostly dialogue. That's how she exists on the page. And she has one purpose, which is to prosecute the villain. Now, I'm, I bet you're probably thinking, okay, Michael, w good thing you told me to jump to this timestamp. Why is all of this stuff important? Well, we have to look at a number of these characters in order to get a sense of what the commonalities are. And I, I think you've already seen kind of what they are here. So when I finished looking at these books, I put them on a spectrum. And I put them on a spectrum based on the number of the number of or the level of description and development. Okay, because that was Debbie's question: is to what extent should I develop a walk-on character? Okay. Now we we looked at Debbie Maycomer, and her walk-on characters had no description and no development. They just served a single purpose. Once they were done, they were done, and they went away and uh, rode off into the sunset. All right. Arthur Haley was right in the middle with Airport. We, we got almost no description of the characters, and we got almost no development, all right? So that was interesting. So it was a little bit more than what Maycomer did. And then James Patterson, uh, again, was the black sheep here. He gave the characters, or at least one of them, a pretty decent description, um, but they got no development, all right? So that's our spectrum here. That's, that's, that's the gamut of, of what these three particular mega bestsellers did with their walk-ons. Now, to answer the questions, to get to our conclusions, because we need to now start bringing this back so that we can be practical. Because remember, I'm not an academic. I'm a pracademic, and I want to give you something that you can use in your next writing session, okay? So to the issue of how many minor characters is too many, personal opinion, just based on what I saw, is as many as your story needs. I don't think that there's a limit. I don't think that there's any restriction. Um, each of the books that I reviewed had dozens of walk-on characters. And they all had a single purpose. So I think you, you include as many, many walk-on characters in your story as your heart desires, subject to the next answer or the next answers to the next issue, which is to what extent do I need to develop each walk-on character in my story? So let's get into the nuts and bolts here. All right. So number one, five out of the six walk-ons had names. So that's kind of an interesting thing, because when I think of walk-on characters initially, I think of a character that maybe doesn't have a name. You know, I think of like a, a customer in a convenience store or somebody that you, you just want to do something with and then they don't need a name, right? They're disposable. But five out of six walk-ons actually had names. Now, 
the funny thing was, after I finished the novel, I didn't remember what their names were. It was just kind of invisible. Um, so it doesn't really matter what you name the characters because they're going to be invisible anyway, and the reader's probably not going to remember them. Okay, but they had names. Now, the second nut here is that every walk-on character had a very obvious single purpose. I cannot say this enough. I've said it about 12,000 times already in this video. But every character had a single purpose. And it's worth talking about what that is. Well, Michael, what is a purpose? Well, I think a purpose is whatever you want that purpose to be. I'm not going to sit here and be prescriptive and say, you got to do this, or a character's got to do this, or a walk-on character has to do that. That's, that's BS, all right? The purpose of the walk-on character is whatever you want that purpose to be. That purpose could be serving as a contrast to the hero to get the reader to understand the hero a little bit better, like we had in Airport with the, the frustrated ticket agent. Um, it could be to introduce a character to a new setting for the first time. All right. Or, I mean, hell, I, I wrote a story where I wrote myself into the story as a cameo uh, just so that I could get, get a laugh out of the readers. Right. That's a valid purpose as well. So the purpose is whatever you need that purpose to be, whether it be advancing the plot, developing a character, doing something with the setting, educating the reader or making them laugh. Doesn't matter. All right. Now, the third nut here is almost every walk on character had no physical description. This was really interesting to me. All right. Because. I think, you know, I, 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 I thought, you know, when I, when I was going into this, my personal thought was, well, every character probably needs to have at least a line or two of description, but that's not how the mega bestsellers do it, at least these three, okay? And I bet that if you look at other mega bestsellers, you'll see something very similar. So they didn't use any physical description. Instead, the author used a smart detail uh, or character tag that branded the walk-on character in the reader's minds. So Alan Harris is an attorney. The author just allowed us to do our own mental gymnastics about what we think an attorney was, and the author didn't do anything that contradicted that. That's important. They, they let us believe that this guy's an attorney, but they didn't do anything to make us say, hey, wait a minute, I thought this guy was an attorney, but he did this and this and no. Typical attorney tropes, all right? That was really interesting. Every character got this really interesting one detail or two details, and that's all they got, all right? Now, the fourth nut, and this is, this is one of the golden takeaways, okay? The more you visualize a character, the more readers think that character is important. Now, remember the character order of magnitude, all right? We're going we're gonna to be visualizing our main character the most. We're going to be visualizing supporting characters. But the mega bestsellers didn't really visualize their walk-ons. So the, I think the, the takeaway here is don't, don't try to be clever and don't try to, to customize your walk-ons and make them, make them very visible and visual in the reader's mind because that's not that's not what the mega bestsellers do. Let me just put it that way. All right. Now James Patterson had a noble ex a notable exception. It's worth pointing out because I know that some of you who have read Along Came a Spider might have might have thought about this. All right. Now James Patterson uh, had an exception, and in Along Come, Came a Spider, uh, there's a couple of sections throughout the novel where uh, Alex Cross tells a story in, in the first person, but then every once in a while. The story floats into the third person, and it is a uh, limited third person of uh, someone who is experiencing something that this serial killer is doing in the story. So, for example, there was one where there was a, a teacher at a school where two, two of the children uh, that the serial killer abducted was, and it's, it's her story about what she saw and how things go. And it's almost like a newspaper article, so to speak. But the interesting thing about this, and this is why I wanted to call this out, was that Patterson does this, and he develops the character. I mean, he doesn't really develop the character, but he gives her a lot of physical description. We get a lot of uh, character opinions. We get a lot of history about who she is and why she's there. You would think that she's a main character. But the thing about this is that it's sandboxed. All of this exists in its own little universe. All right, And I think that's really, really interesting. It's really insightful. And it's really important. And it's one of the things, it's one of, it's one of those, it's, it's really cool because it's one of those few times that the mega bestsellers tip their hand. It's like usually they do stuff that's so good and you don't know they're doing it. Here is an example where Patterson's just kind of laying his cards out on the table, right? Because typically when he's using his walk-on characters, he doesn't really do very much with them. But this time he does, but he does it in a sandbox. Kind of interesting, isn't it? So, so basically you can, you can kind of draw a box around the exceptions. So this person that he developed was an important witness, but not terribly important to the story. 
Okay, just wanted to call that out. Okay, that's not it's an exception. It's not a rule. And I don't even know if Patterson does this very often throughout the rest of the series, but I thought you guys might find that kind of fun. All right, so next nut, I got a lot of nuts, I told you. So visualization equals importance, uh, but dialogue does not based on what I saw, okay? So all six of the walk-ons were conveyed exclusively through dialogue. Very little description, mostly dialogue, a little bit of action, you know, like he frowned or he waved his hand at the judge, you know, that sort of thing. Um, which is really interesting, isn't it? Like, I always think, when I think of, of characters, I want to describe that character. But the more you describe that character, the more important the reader thinks they are, and you don't want to fool the reader on that. So, But if you use dialogue, you can put a ton of dialogue on the page, and it doesn't really matter. The, the reader ingests that dialogue, but they don't, they don't ascribe dialogue with importance. So I think the takeaway here, at least the takeaway for me, I hope somebody else finds this helpful, is that the more you visualize, the more important things are, but you can, you can write dialogue to your heart's content and you can get away with a lot, all right? So that's, I thought was really fun. Now, the next thing, uh, the average number of appearances for each of these walk-on characters was about three to four times, maybe a little bit more. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, and I think the mega bestsellers would scoff at you if you ask them, how many times should a walk-on character appear in a story? But I, I put this in here because I know somebody's going to ask it. I don't think it matters. I think you have to do what serves your book, and that's it. You know. Now, next thing here, uh, all of the six walk-ons received zero character development. Zero character development. Um, the, the one exception was Patsy, the, the frustrated ticket agent. Um, the, the heroine took the time to educate her on how to be a better employee, okay? So you could argue that that was uh, some development, but the only reason that development was there was to serve the heroine so that the reader could see what a, what a good, competent um, manager she was, all right? So therefore, what I think is that walk-ons serve to develop the main character in some situations, but the development always serves another purpose, not the development of that character. Let's talk about the big conclusions. What can you, t you can take all that stuff away, but now let's talk about, let's, let's distill all this stuff down into a couple of golden nuggets, okay? And that is first, that the number of walk-ins don't matter, only what suits your story. And then the more you visualize a character, the more important they are. So avoid visualizing your walk-ons too much. Use dialogue and action instead to do what you need them to do. And then lastly, walk-ons are like plastic utensils. You know, it's kind of like the, the, the paper plates and, and the paper for, or the, the plastic forks and knives that you use at a barbecue. <laughs> you use it once and then it goes in the trash can. That's kind of like walk-on characters. This is probably the one time where we have an excuse to be crappy people as writers. <laughs> Just use them up and throw them away. That's the best way to think about this, all right? So if you guys like this video, you will love my writing craft playbook. It is a free book. And it's 20 fiction and nonfiction tricks to keep your readers in the zone. And I get nuts and bolty and super granular and super analytical, just like this video in this playbook. And you can get that at authorlevelup.com slash fan club. A lot of people have signed up for it and have been very satisfied. And if you have a craft question, feel free to holler at me. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying doing these videos. I'm learning a lot. And you can contact me at authorlevelup.com slash contact. And uh, if I can, uh, I will do another analytical video just like this. Just like I helped Debbie out, I can help you guys. So anyway, thank you for watching this video. Hope you found it helpful. Let me know what you thought in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe. Perfect.